Hello, everyone, and very good evening to you all. This is Kapil Gautam, and today on the behalf of Miro I team, I will be hosting this session, and I feel extremely privileged to welcome you all for the today's session. Also, I'd like to uh, thank you all for asking the uh, for uh, taking the time out from your busy schedules and uh, making our program with your invaluable presence. Thank you for joining us. Now, I would like to begin today's session and also I'd like to uh, let you all know that we'll be having our discussion session at the end of the webinar. So, uh, we, if you have any queries in, in between, in between the session, you uh, uh, just drop on the comment section and we'll be get back to you on later. Today, as I speaking delegates, we have Professor Mark Billmore, all the way from the United Kingdom, uh, who is an EM of uh, EMC of Tom, PhD, fellow of American Academy of Optometry from <clears throat> University of Houston and College of Optometry. I want to welcome you on the behalf of Mirai Foundation and all the participants, Dr. Mark. Well, good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, so, doctor. Yes, so okay, good. And, I appreciate uh, your invitation. We've had a few technical challenges here. I'm in a hotel in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and uh, the connection's not great, but we'll see what we can do. Um, as uh, my introduction said, I'm, at the, I'm affiliated with the University of Houston down in Texas, but I make my home in Boulder, Colorado. And my website, bullers2020.com, um, is where you can uh, find it, me if you want to get a hold of me. And uh, I'm also on Twitter at uh, Bullers2020. So I'm from the UK, but I've spent most of my career in the United States. So I spent time at the University of California at Berkeley. That's the top left. At Ohio State, that's the top right. But now I live in Colorado. And uh, that funny looking picture on the uh, bottom right, that's my green card. And yes, I know it's pink, but uh, I guess the immigration people have a funny sense of humor. Um, I've had the good fortune to uh, interact with some people from Nepal over the years. So there's Mahesh and uh, that looks like Nabin. Um, but uh, I've had uh, the chance to uh, work with these good people or mentor them or interact with them or teach them. Uh, there's also Suresh who's in the US, whose last name I can't pronounce. But uh, anyway, so I feel like a kin. Um, I do make my living working for uh, the uh, uh, optical industry, and uh, there's a number of companies there that have uh, uh, supported me over the years. Um, I'm not going to share my slides today beyond what's going to be on YouTube, but if you want um, a list of recommended reading, you can go to my website, and if you go to the presenter tag, you'll see a link to uh, a number of uh, resources. And most of these papers are open access, so you can uh, take a look at them. Um, one in particular I'd uh, direct your attention to is this uh, recent review that Catherine Richdale and I did. And a lot of the things I'm going to talk about today are covered in there, and you can read that at your leisure. So when we talk about myopia and myopia control, um, we really live in an evidence-based world. And this is the evidence-based pyramid where the lowest evidence is at the bottom and the highest evidence is at the top. And we could even put things further at the top. So we have randomized, randomized controlled clinical trials, um, but we could even go further than that and have meta-analyses of multiple studies that really um, present stronger evidence. And in this day and age, it's important to remember that the lowest form of evidence are the things that we find on social media and from politicians. And if the COVID-19 crisis is told as anything, particularly in the US, we shouldn't believe anything we read online and anything that comes out of the mouth of a politician, one in particular. So I'm going to talk for the first part of this talk about the evidence base for myopia control and what works and what doesn't. 
And most of the time, I'm going to be talking about randomized clinical trials, but there are some other important studies that have used historical controls. Ideally, when we have a myopia study, we have both axial length, hopefully measured with optical biometry, and refractive error, hopefully measured with psychoplegic order refraction. We also like to see masking. So if possible, the subjects and the investigators don't know what is uh, whether the subject whether the patient's in a treatment or a control group. Um, and finally, um, I'm not going to talk really about contralateral studies or before and after studies because uh, contralateral studies tend to be short term and give us a little indication, but that's not how we use things in the real world. And before and after studies are particularly bad because they are subject to a lot of bias. Um, one other thing... I'm not going to talk about percentages very much today. So when I present you data on the effectiveness of treatment, I'm going to generally give the numbers in millimeters or in diopters. Um, percentages can be very misleading, uh, depending on who studied and for how long. And I prefer to talk in millimeters of myopia control because that's really the therapeutic dose of what we're doing. And as you will remember from your education, one millimeter is about two and a half diopters, or 0.1 millimeters is a quarter of diopter. So if I'm not showing both, you'll have some sense of what's going on. So I'm gonna take a quick sip of coffee because it's still a little early here. So let's talk firstly about spectacle lenses. And one thing that we know is under minus and makes things worse. So there are two um, clinical trials um, that have in particular have looked at the effect of under minus in. and both of them find that the subjects that were under minus actually progressed faster so um, under minus in is actually probably the worst thing we can do because a the subject might not see as well um, but also it's going to lead to faster progression um, likewise with progressive addition lenses this is an area that's been very well studied and here are two very large clinical trials, one from Hong Kong and one from the United States, both showing the same thing. Um, in the Hong Kong study, a two-year study, there was a slowing of myopia progression by less than a quarter. And likewise, in the Comet study, which was conducted in the US, there was, again, a treatment effect over three years that was statistically significant, but clinically meaningless. Uh, it's less than a quarter diopter. So that's really not good enough. Now, in the Comet study, they did do a sub-analysis. And when they broke subjects down by whether they, were, uh, they had accommodative lag or not, and whether they were ESO, EXO, or ortho, they found that the treatment effect was actually greatest and significantly greater in the subjects who are esophoric and who had larger than average accommodative lags. And for many people, the story ends there. So, okay, we prescribe this lens to these patients. But the investigators went a step further and they did a second study to actually test that hypothesis. And in the second study, which they imagine it to be called Comet 2, uh, they found pretty much the same result. So they only recruited subjects who were esophoric and who had larger accommodative lags. And they found, again, a treatment effect over three years of about a quarter of a diopter. So there's really no compelling evidence that accommodative lag and esophoria lead to greater treatment effects. Now, some, some investigators have reported larger treatment effects in uh, executive bifocals. So this was a randomized clinical trial of over 100 Chinese-Canadian children, and they were randomly assigned to one of three lenses, single vision, uh, a one-and-a-half diopter executive bifocal, and an executive bifocal with some base in prism. And you can see, uh, based on the refractive numbers down the bottom there, that both bifocals slowed myopia by a meaningful amount. Now, if you look at the axial length data, you'll see that there's really no difference between the bifocal and the prism bifocal, but both had a slowing of about a quarter of a millimeter, that's over half a diopter, but over a three-year period. So let's pause briefly to think about mechanisms of myopia control. Now, if I'd have been given this talk 20 years ago, I would have probably waxed on about the accommodative lag theory. Um, but our prevailing theory of myopia development and myopia control is the peripheral refraction theory. 
but you can see there's some commonalities between the two. Um, they both have the same underlying sort of premise that the image being focused behind the retina will cause the eye to grow. Of course, now we know that it's what's going on in the periphery, or we believe it's what's going on in the periphery that stimulates eye growth. And if we treat the periphery with plus, then we can get a uh, slow end of myopia. And you know, I won't bore you with these uh, image shells here, but clearly the goal of a lot of our myopia control therapies is to create a myopic to focus in the periphery. Now, there are some flaws in this theory. Um, it's not clear that uh, peripheral refraction has anything to do with the rate of progression or indeed possibly the onset of myopia. But clinical therapy is based on the placing of plus power in the periphery are consistent with studies in non-human primates uh, that show a clear role for the peripheral retina. Um, so if you uh, want to read more about this, I direct you to uh, some of the animal studies. Um, but as shown on this uh, graph here, it's clear that the studies or the therapies that work the best are the strategies that have peripheral components. Now, I talked about earlier the ineffectiveness of PALs and the greater effectiveness of, of, of executives. And I believe you can perhaps take this as uh, indirect evidence of the importance of peripheral vision, because if these lenses were working on the basis of accommodation or accommodative lag, you would expect the two of them to have equal effects. Um, but of course, the executive has a much greater effect based on these two independent clinical trials. Um, that's possibly because with the PAL, you've got a relatively small area of plus, but with the executive, you're bathing the entire sort of half of the retina in plus power due to the ad. Now, of course, if that works, if that's true, then we see, should see um, some other benefits with other strategies for putting plus in the periphery. And the first one, of course, is with ortho K, which will correct the central cornea relieve the peripheral cornea relatively unaffected um, and give us the desired effect. And early on, um, people sort of found that regular RGPs really had no effect on myopia progression. But then there was kind of a revolution in orthokeratology that really brought this into more of a mainstream and reverse geometry designs, corneal topography, and highly gas permeable materials um, allowed these lenses to be worn overnight. Now, the initial goal was to just reduce myopia and give a patient Hello. clear vision during the day. Hello. Hello. Oh, yes, Doctor. I don't know what that was. Okay. Um, but one of the... Uh, pleasant surprises with ortho K is that it was observed that myopia progression uh, slowed in patients wearing these lenses. And the first real evidence of a slowing of myopia control uh, came from this study by Pauline Cho and her colleagues. And they found over a two-year period, subjects wearing uh, corneal reshaping lenses uh, were progressed or elongated by about a quarter millimeter less than a control group or a comparison group that were wearing spectacles. And Jeff Wallin and colleagues showed a similar effect in North American children. Um, but then <clears throat> the most compelling evidence, of course, came from a randomized clinical trial where subjects were uh, randomized for a two year period. And again, you saw about a quarter millimeter slowing of axial elongation in the subjects wearing ortho K. So again, that's between a half and three quarters of a diopter. One thing that's impressive about ortho K is with, when you look across a number of studies and conduct a meta-analysis, as many people have done, you see that there's a remarkably consistent finding across all of these studies around the world. It doesn't matter what kind of lenses, the treatment effect is always around about a quarter of a millimeter over two years. Well, that's ortho K. What about soft contact lenses with different power zones? Well, early attempts were really not that effective uh, or not that successful. Um, this was a, uh, a contact lens 
designed to slow um, hyperopia. And they got a reasonable effect over a, a one-year period. Um, this lens was, uh, for a variety of reasons, never commercialized, but it was certainly promising. Um, using commercially available lenses, uh, Jeff Wallin and colleagues found um, a two-year slow-in of myopia in a multifocal lens compared to a control group of soft lens wearers. But again, these, this was not a randomized clinical trial. Um, more recently, the Brian Holden Vision Institute conducted a very large study on a number of different designs. Uh, there was obviously a single lens control, but there were two lenses that had uh, myopic defocus and two lenses that had an extended depth of focus. And what they found over the two-year period that compared to the controls, all four designs slowed axial elongation by a similar amount. There was a, a slowing of around about uh, 0.15 maybe uh, millimeters of, uh, of axial elongation and a slowing perhaps of uh, maybe 0 0.3, 0 0.4 diopters of myopia progression. Now, the big game changer, of course, was uh, last year's publication of the MySight trial. This was a three-year clinical trial conducted in uh, uh, three different, four different countries. And what you see here is that there was a, about a three-quarter diopter slow end of myopia progression in subjects wearing the MySight lens compared to a control self lens and about a 0.3 millimeter slowing and really good correlation between the axial elongation and the myopia progression. So this was uh, a big finding, which of course led to the approval of the lens by the FDA in the United States, although it had been available um, in a lot of other places around the world. Um, their publications open access and one of the nice features is it summarizes not only their data, um, but also st uh, other studies from around the world. And one of the things you can see from the table is that not only was this the longest study, it also produced the largest treatment effect. Well, what about spectacles? We've talked already about uh, the ineffectiveness of PALs and why executives might work better. Um, there were attempts uh, some years ago to, um, to put or to design different kinds of spectacle lenses. And these three different lenses that are, were evaluated by the Brian Holden Vision Institute um, were essentially radial progressives. All of them had increasing plus power away from the center towards the periphery. And none of them were really very effective. Um, there was suggestion that a, a subgroup of the subjects in one design did very well, but um, in a follow-up study um, based on the commercialized version of this lens, the MyoVision lenses, um, there was no treatment benefit of these lenses. So this is a lens really that we shouldn't be prescribing because it doesn't work. Now, more recently, there's been a lot of excitement out of Hong Kong um, related to the uh, DIMS lens. Um, this is the defocus incorporated multiple segment lens. And this lens has a sort of normal central portion, but around the periphery, there's these one millimeter segments, each of which that has about a three and a half diopter add. And again, the results were quite impressive. Over a two year period, uh, the control group um, progressed relatively normally, um, but there was a slow in of about three quarters of a diopter and a slow in of axial elongation of about 0.3 millimeters over a two year period. And that has led, of course, to Hoya commercializing this technology in some parts of the world. And it'll be interesting to see uh, how it is uh, evaluated in independent studies moving forward. There's also other investigations ongoing that use um, related technology. So this is the lens that's being evaluated by the F uh, under the auspices of the FDA in the United States. This is uh, Sight Glass is the name of this company. And they, you may have seen recently published or talked about in a press release, their one-year data showing a meaningful slowing of myopia over a one-year period. This is a three-year trial, so we're going to have to wait um, a little bit longer for the punchline. But again, the results seem very promising. And of course, our friends at Essilor are pursuing some technology in this area as well. And they have a two-year clinical trial ongoing in China 
and the results of that should be available later this year. Um, but from what I understand, the uh, one-year results were very, very promising. So there's going to be a lot of activity in the spectacle lens uh, field with a number of uh, specialized designs. Well, let's talk a little bit about um, pharmacology and atropine. And what we know in general about pharmaceutical approaches is even though lowering the IOP might be a reasonable approach, beta blockers are uh, unaffected or ineffective, so should I say. Coffee time again. So let's first of all think about how atropine might control myopia. Now, a compelling and very important piece of evidence comes from an animal study in chickens. And the researchers found that atropine was effective in controlling experimental myopia in chicks. Now, that's important because the chicken is not like uh, a human uh, or even an Englishman. It uh, has striated and not smooth ciliary muscle. So atropine, which is an anti-muscarinic, would not have any effect on its accommodation. And what it's believed, although it's still not completely clear, is that atropine is acting on muscarinic receptors in the retina. Now, atropine's a non-selective muscarinic antagonist. It works equally on all five different muscarinic receptors. So there have been some attempts, and there will continue to be attempts, to look at selective muscarinic antagonists that could selectively target M1 or maybe M3 receptors in the retina. One such study or one such drug was a drug called parenzepine, a drug that was previously approved for uh, uh, internal use for uh, gastric problems. And this was evaluated in gel form in children. And again, you can see that it was reasonably effective at slowing the progression of myopia over a 12-month period. Now, for a variety of reasons, that drug was not pursued towards FDA approval, but I expect over the coming years, we're gonna see other selective muscarinic antagonists uh, being developed and evaluated. Um, but for the moment, when it comes to pharmacology, atropine is the, the big dog. And one of the reasons for that is that uh, the ATOM study, which was conducted in Singapore, found a, um, a really compelling slowing of myopia progression over a two year period. Now, it's important to remember in the ATOM study that treatment was unilateral. The subjects were only treated in one eye. So each, each subject either had atropine or a placebo put in one eye and the other eye was not treated. But what they found is over a two-year period, uh, the placebo eyes progressed by about a, about a diopter and a quarter and the uh, atropine-treated eyes uh, progressed by about a quarter diopter. So you've got a one diopter slowing of myopia over a two-year period. Um, now, the same was true largely for axial elongation. Uh, and again, the atropine-treated eyes really didn't grow very much at all, um, whereas the placebo eyes grew by about 0.4. Now, one of the challenges with that particular uh, treatment regime is when the kids were taken off the atropine, there was a dramatic rebound effect. And if you look at the top line here, this is the axial elongation in the uh, atropine eyes. And what they found um, was that uh, uh, during the washout year, the year when treatment was withdrawn, the atropine eyes progressed by over a diopter, almost as much as the placebo eyes had progressed over the prior two years. So this was a problem. Uh, of course, this was a unilateral study, so maybe the rebound effect was accentuated by the fact that only one eye was treated. So in part because of uh, the findings of that first study, um, the investigators conducted a study called ATOM2. And in ATOM2, there was no control group, but treat subjects were randomized to three different concentrations of atropine which were administered bilaterally. And what they found is when compared to the control group from the original ATOM study, there was a pronounced slowing of myopia progression in all three concentrations of atropine. So the 0.5% atropine group progressed by about a third and the 0.01% group progressed by about half a diopter. So that was a slowing over two years 
uh, relative to the original comparison group of about three quarters of a diopter. They also found, of course, that the low doses didn't really affect pupil size or accommodation very much. So what you have here is apparently a very useful treatment that doesn't have the nasty side effects of higher concentrations of atropine. And again, for many people, the story ends there. 0.01% is what we should be using. But there's a problem. And the problem comes from the axial length data. So what I'm showing you on the left here are the spherical equivalent data showing that in the original study, the comparison group progressed by a diopter and a quarter, and there was about between a 0.7 and a 0.9 diopter slowing in the three different concentrations of atropine. But when you look at the axial elongation data, they tell a different story. Remember in the first study, the control group progressed by about 0.4 millimeters over two years. But all three groups in the second study progressed by almost as much. And if you look at the bottom here, the 0.01% uh, group, they're no different from the comparison of the first study. So 0.01% Atropine may slow myopia by an accommodative effect, but it doesn't have any effect on axial elongation. Now, some of us have continued to point this problem out in the literature uh, with letters to the editor and such like. Um, but more importantly, there are now ongoing and some published studies repeating these uh, or expanding on these original atropine studies and looking at low concentration atropine. And one such study that's already been published out of Hong Kong is the LAMP study, where they looked at three different concentrations of atropine, 0 0.05, 0 0.025, and 0.01% compared to a uh, placebo. And they randomized over 400 kids to these four different treatments. And what I'm showing you here on the left is the spherical equivalent, the refractive error data, and on the right, the axial elongation data. And you can see from both, there's a good um, dose response uh, effect here. What you can see in yellow is the progression elongation in the um, placebo eyes. And in blue, the highest concentration atropine slows uh, uh, myopia progression by around about uh, half a diopter over one year. And it slows axial elongation by about 0.2 millimeters. What you can also see is that the, and on the upper right here, is the 0.01% atropine, the gray line, really has no impact on axial elongation over the one year uh, trial. So that's actually consistent with the ATOM study, the 0.01% doesn't slow axial elongation. So in spite of all this research and ongoing studies, and there are many other published studies, some reasonable, some complete fast, um, we still really don't know a lot about atropine. Um, we're unclear what concentration to, that should be used. A lot of people around the world are still using 0.01%. Um, people who are more educated and informed are using higher concentrations, but uh, and that's what that's certainly what I believe the evidence shows. Um, we don't know when to start. We don't know when to stop. Um, one of the intriguing things with atropine is that perhaps if we gave it to people, uh, gave it to children before they developed myopia, particularly if they were at high risk based on parental history and such like, um, maybe we could delay the onset of myopia by a meaningful amount. Um, as I said, we don't know when to stop. Um, people talk about tapering of higher concentrations of atropine, but we don't have any data. Um, we don't, you know, it's all seat of the pants kind of thing. Um, with atropine, of course, you still need to correct uh, the uh, patient's uh, refractive error. So why not incorporate um, a myopia control um, option into their corrections rather than uh, just giving them a single vision correction? Um, but again, we don't have much data on combination treatments. And finally, there's some issues with uh, what's in the bottle because at the moment um, in the US and elsewhere in the world, we rely on compounding pharmacies to make up this low concentration atropine. Now I'm going to change gears a little bit <clears throat> and talk about um, sort of quantifying myopia control. 
And one thing that uh, I want to be clear, and you probably got a sense of this from uh, what I presented already, is that axial length is our metric of choice in clinical trials for assessing effectiveness. Um, that's because uh, people don't lose vision and aren't at increased risk of ocular disease because of thick and heavy spectacles. It's because their eyes are elongated and the stress placed on the internal oc ocular structures. And there's a variety of reasons why axial length is a more important outcome measure in clinical trials. Um, I've already talked about the disconnect between axial length and refractive error in atropine. Um, and the same is obviously true in ortho-K. Once you put an ortho-K on the eye, you can only really assess ocular growth by or refractive development by uh, measuring axial elongation because the kid hopefully has been rendered anatropic. Um, the other thing I want to emphasize is that there is a very compelling relationship between axial elongation and visual impairment. Uh, these are data, which I'm going to show you in more detail in a minute, out of the Netherlands. And what you can see here is the cumulative risk of visual impairment as a function of age in different axial lengths. And the interesting thing is here, when the investigators did a statistical model which allowed refractive error and axial elongation to compete, um, only axial elongation had a significant relationship with visual impairment. Refractive error was no longer significant. So axial length is kind of where it's at. The other thing I want to emphasize is that, as I've done today, it's important to talk about absolute treatment effect, preferably in millimeters, but also in diopters, and not to talk about percentages. That's because absolute treatment effect is clearly consistent across subject ages. It seems to be consistent across progression rates, and it also seems to be consistent across race. When you talk about percentages, those will vary dramatically with age, race, and underlying progression rate. So um, I would encourage you to think, start talking about the absolute therapeutic benefit in terms of millimeters. So we've been encouraging people to stop thinking of efficacy as a percentage, and instead, uh, we've come up with this acronym, which people either love or hate, which is uh, called CARE, which is the cumulative absolute reduction in axial elongation. So how much is our therapy reducing the elongation of the eye? Because obviously, that's what we want to do. Now, one of the other interesting things is you can go to the literature and see, okay, what is the greatest CARE, the greatest reduction in elongation that's been reported? And you can see at the top of the, the table here are two studies of orthokeratology, which have found treatment effects of a little over 0.4 millimeters. Now, what's interesting to note is that these were multi, multi-year studies. These, it, these took over five years to uh, achieve this effect. Now, if you look further down, you can see the DIMS study down here, the LAM paper. This is the Chamberlain. This is the MySite paper. Okay, but... The important thing here is we don't have any evidence that we can slow myopia by more than 0.4 of a millimeter, um, which is about a diopter and a quarter, maybe a diopter depending on how you uh, do the math. So why is that important? Well, um, there's a lot of these myopia calculators out there. The, perhaps the best known one is the uh, Brian Holden Vision Institute calculator. And these are really useful and the data, I think, are fairly strong when it comes to plotting out the expected progression of a myopic child. So if you know, as in this example, you've got a six-year-old who's a half a diopter myopic, you can predict with some certainty that they're likely to become a high myope by the age, by the time they leave school. Now, that's a good feature of these calculators. And these are really useful for talking with parents at the point of sale while you're discussing myopia management. Where they're not so sound is when you look at the treatment effect, because as I've told you already, um, the maximum that has been demonstrated is only about a diopter or so. So to present something to a parent and say that we're going to slow myopia by three or four diopters is, um, I think, questionable in terms of its ethics. 
Um, all of these calculators assume a, assume a constant treatment effect over time. And again, that doesn't happen. You might get 49% in the first year, but you're going to get less in the second and third. And as I said before, we shouldn't be talking about percentages anyway. Um, in terms of uh, the dream versus reality, 50% um, efficacy might produce the, uh, the green line there, but we should be fairly modest in our um, uh, promises that we make to patients in terms of what we can actually achieve in terms of slowing myopia. Now, the question is, well, if we can only control the diopter of myopia, is that really worth it? Well, the answer is yes. And uh, Noel Brennan and I published a paper um, last year um, called uh, Why Each Diopter Matters. And we, we laid out really three broad features of why myopia control is important. Uh, the first is, of course, you know, I see better uh, without my glasses because I'm only about a minus two than somebody with a higher level of myopia. Um, but perhaps more surprisingly, um, lower myopes see much better or significantly better than higher myopes, even when they are corrected. And the higher myopes tend to take more risks with their contact lenses. So better vision all round with less levels of myopia. Secondly, the child of today, uh, the myopic child of today will become the refractive surgery candidate of tomorrow. And you're going to get better outcomes with refractive surgery with less myopia. But the number one important feature of myopia control and why it's important is the reduced risk of vision impairment associated with higher levels of myopia. So in theory, we can lower the incidence of, of disease and lower the risk of visual impairment. So let me take you through some of those, uh, those data that underlie that uh, statement. Now, first of all, the big baddie is myopic maculopathy. This is the leading cause of visual impairment in higher levels of myopia. And you can find these nice uh, scary photographs to share to your patients, although I don't recommend it. But they're useful in classifying the course of the disease. Now, one of the things that Noel and I did in this paper is we took data from five large studies representing over 20,000 patients, and we plotted the percentage of patients with myopic maculopathy as a function of level of myopia. And these are five studies from three different continents. Now, when you take those data and replot them on a log scale, uh, something remarkable happens, or we found it remarkable, all five of these studies seem to have a very similar slope. So we've taken an exponential function, plot it on a log scale, and now we've got a series of straight lines. And the average slope there was about 1.67. So what that means is each additional diopter is associated with a 67% increase in the prevalence of myopic maculopathy. Um, turn that around, each diopter less reduces the prevalence of myopic maculopathy by 40%. And I know 40%, 67%, it's basically one is five over three, one is three over five. Okay. But so in theory, we could lower the risk of myopic maculopathy by 40% by just controlling that one diopter of myopia. Okay. That's a huge public health effect. Now, the other thing is that because these are straight lines, each diopter less reduces the risk by 40%, regardless of whether you're at the high end or the low end of the uh, myopia curve. Um, so it doesn't matter whether you're a minus three or a minus six. Now, when we look at blindness and visual impairment uh, with myopic maculopathy, one of the things that's important to note is that around about half the cases of myopic maculopathy occur in myopes below five diopters. That's because there's more of them, okay? And that, this is uh, consistent with Ian Flitcroft's uh, statement that there's no safe level of myopia. So I want you to remember that, or think of myopic maculopathy as not a disease of high myopia, it's a disease of myopia. Now you can do the same for a number of other conditions. We know that myopia increases the risk of glaucoma, so here's five studies looking at different levels of myopia. And again, they all follow a similar trajectory. They're spread out because of different diagnostic criteria. Um, but each diopter increases risk of glaucoma by 
Same for posterior subcapsular cataract. Each diopter increases the risk by about 21%. And again, these are four studies done in different parts of the world. And finally, retinal detachment, which we all associated all associate with uh, myopia. Um, it doesn't matter where in the world this is studied, each diopter increases the risk by about 30%. And the data down the bottom, uh, annual incidence of retinal detachment, the line at the top is the lifetime incidence. And again, has a very similar trajectory. So each diopter increases the risk by 30%. Now, let's, that's all very interesting. But most of those diseases I've talked about are, um, are treatable. So you can take a cataract out, you can manage glaucoma. What about visual impairment? So our friends in the Netherlands, again, provided these excellent data. And they have data on 15,000 patients in whom they have both visual acuity data and refractive error data. So what... Uh, we did was uh, we took their data and what you can see here is for five different age groups this is the cumulative risk of visual impairment as a function of myopia and again there's an exponential relationship there regardless of age now when you again invoke the power of logarithms and you plot the same data on a logarithmic scale you see that all five ages seem to have a very similar trajectory, okay? And each diopter more of myopia increases the risk of visual impairment by 25%. So again, turning that on its head, you could say that regardless of the age of patients, um, each diopter that we could control would reduce the risk of visual impairment by 20%. And again, that's a huge public health effect. So some sound bites that uh, you can take home with you today, you're probably already home, is the control in myopia progression by one diopter has the potential to reduce the risk of myopic maculopathy by 40%, to reduce the risk of open angle glaucoma by 20%, and reduce the risk of visual impairment by 20%. And I haven't shown you this today, but um, our calculations suggest that uh, one one diopter of visual impairment can be saved um, on average. So, okay, myopia control, what are you waiting for? Well, you may be um, handcuffed by where you are in the world and what's available to you, but it's reasonable to, assume, to assess whether there's a downside, whether there's a risk associated with these modalities. Um, some people say, well, people don't see so well with myopia control. Um, and that's not strictly true. Because when you look at data from uh, David Bernson's excellent work on uh, Ortho-K, you see that there's really no change in high contrast visual acuity in patients wearing Ortho-K. <coughs> and that's dilated. Now, when you dilate the patients and measure low contrast visual acuity, which is a much more stringent measure of vision, yes, you'll see a little bit um, uh, reduced low contrast visual acuity. But I can say as somebody who uh, wore ortho K or corneal refractive therapy lenses for about seven years, the vision's pretty good. What about with uh, multifocal or myopia to control lenses? You can see a similar thing here down the bottom. There's really not much effect or no change whatsoever on high contrast visual acuity. The data at the top of the graph are for low illumination, low contrast. And again, um, obviously vision under those circumstances is a little poorer but you can see that there's a small decrement in the uh, vision with uh, either the MySight lens or uh, a more standard multifocal. And finally, if we look at data from the uh, MySight clinical trial, so this is on real kids wearing lenses bilaterally for three years, you see that um, there's really no difference or there is no significant difference in the visual acuity um, in the kids wearing my sight, in the kids wearing the standard soft lenses. Uh, in fact, maybe at some places during the study, the my sight kids are seeing a little bit better. So um, that's visual acuity. But of course, when we think about contact lenses, the dark side is really corneal infections. So what is the risk 
of contact lens wear in general. So there are a lot of data out there, and this is one from uh, one of my favorite papers, Fiona Stapleton, which is um, almost 300 cases of microbial keratitis associated with uh, contact lens wear. And you can see the numbers are presented here in cases per 10,000 years. That's because the incidence is low, and we need some way to present them uh, in a way that uh, um, is interpretable. You okay there, people? I can hear you. Oh, that's All fine. Right. That's it. Yeah. Okay. I'm almost done. So uh, and then we may have some time for some questions. So um, <clears throat> one of the uh, features we see here is that the safest form of contact lenses is daily wear. But as kids, or sorry, as people sleep in their lenses occasionally or sleep in their lenses regularly, the, the uh, risk is uh, increased. But these are data on adults. It doesn't say anything about kids. And it doesn't say anything about ortho K. So I published a big review paper a few years ago, um, which again, you can access online, safety of contact lenses. And really, the, the conclusion is that the incidence of any corneal infiltrative events, including MK, is much lower in 8 to 12-year-olds than it is in adults. Um, and... Uh, one of the papers I uh, leaned heavily on here was the, uh, uh, the clay study, which was a large retrospective study. And what I've done here is I've replotted their data. <coughs> and I'm showing the incidence of various corneal infiltrative events in different age groups. And what you can see is quite clearly the incidence is lowest in the 8 to 12-year-olds. And this, of course, is the population that we would be thinking about introduce into myopia control, be it with soft lenses or other methods. The, incre the uh, incidence of microbial keratitis and other infiltrative events increases in teenagers. And of course, when kids go off to college, the wheels completely uh, fall off. Um, and uh, what they also found, this is very likely linked to the behavior of the, uh, the subjects. Um, on the right here um, are data showing the uh, percentage of kids or subjects engaging in risky behaviors as a function of age. And whether it's showering, sleeping, wearing lenses when you've got a cold, uh, sleeping in lenses when you've been drinking, the data seem to follow a same pattern. So this seems to be uh, behavior rather than biology. And it doesn't matter whether you consider only these retrospective data. Um, the same effect was really evident when you looked at prospective studies. So there's six prospective studies on the left <coughs> um, showing a very low incidence of corneal infiltrates in young children. If you look at the retrospective data uh, from the clay study, they're showing in the middle in orange, you can see the, the same uh, in fact, and you can see from prospective studies of adults, again, the rates are much higher than they are in children. So um, what about ortho K? Again, the only data that's really out there on microbial keratitis in ortho K is a retrospective study we did some years ago uh, where we uh, recruited uh, practitioners and asked them about randomly selected groups of their patients. And what we found was that in children, the rate of MK in orthokeratology, overnight orthokeratology was about 14 per 10,000. Okay, but with a fairly broad confidence interval because of the modest sample. But what you can see is that the risk associated with ortho K is higher than daily wear soft lenses. And it's probably higher or more similar to over, uh, overnight or extended wear soft lenses. Now, finally, I just want to talk about uh, myopia prevention because I think that's something we're going to get into in the coming years. And can we predict which myopia, which child becomes myopia? Yes, we can. And actually, our best predictor is a fairly simple one. Um, if a six-year-old has less than three quarters of a diopter of, hy of hyperopia, they're very likely or they're at high risk of developing myopia. Uh, likewise, there's other cut points in older children. And in fact, if you've got an 11-year-old who's emotropic, 
quite possible, quite likely they're going to become uh, myopic. So if we did have a treatment, uh, we could use that. The other thing that, of course, is uh, a predictor of uh, who becomes myopic is outdoor activity and also, to some extent, the number of myopic parents. So here's data from uh, the uh, Rinder study looking at uh, the number of uh, hours spent playing sports each week um, and chance of becoming myopic. Um, and you can see that the more time spent outside playing sports, the lower the risk of myopia. And the same is true whether you've got zero, one or two myopic kids. So if you're English, Australian or uh, Nepalese, sending kids outside to play cricket is a good idea. So once a, um, yeah, a child is identified, could we delay onset? Well, one thing that we know uh, probably isn't as strongly associated with myopia progression and myopia onset as we might think is the use of uh, computers and other digital devices. And the reason that the evidence is not strong is kind of shown here. When you look at the epidemic or the pandemic of myopia that developed in East Asia, um, that was happening in the 80s um, to kids who were growing up in the 70s. And that was even before the personal computer was really ubiquitous and well before <coughs> the introduction of smartphones and tablets. So really there's a disconnect between the time course of the introduction of these devices and the myopia epidemic. And indeed, most studies really have difficulty showing an association between digital devices and myopia. Now, as I said before, the one important thing is, the, or the one thing that can be done to slow myopia is to send kids outside. And there's a couple of graphics that really uh, demonstrate the change in mindset um, between uh, 20 years ago and more recently. And there have been, um, and there are ongoing clinical trials uh, demonstrating or evaluating the effect of spending more time outside. And this was one of the first studies. And they... Um, uh, randomized kids to uh, spending more time outdoors during recess or doing what they did normally. And they found in the uh, outside group, the incidence of myopia um, over the study period was reduced from around about 18% to closer to 8%. So this is quite an intriguing um, possibility. And already we're seeing other interventions explored like uh, you know, glass classrooms. So um, in terms of uh, spending time outdoors, it's a great idea. It definitely delays onset of myopia. And there's some limited evidence, though not compelling, that it can slow the progression. Now, at this stage, we don't know what the magic bullet is. We don't know whether it's the brighter bluer light that has the effect, the alter op altered optics or pupil size or something else. We don't know exactly what it is about going outside that is benefit. But the public health message is a great one because um, if spending time outside is good for your eyes, it's also good for obesity and cardiovascular health. So it's something that uh, we as eye care practitioners can embrace. Now, um, if you want to engage more in these uh, discussions, uh, there's a Facebook group I recommend to you. I know uh, some of you uh, spend time on there. Um, but there's a lot of pretty high level discussion about management of individual cases and also discussion of new papers that come out. So I would uh, recommend that to you. Um, likewise, if you want to connect with me, uh, my email address is uh, bullers2020 at gmail.com. Um, bullers2020 is the key component here because it's also bullers2020.com is my uh, website address. And um, I want to thank you for your attention and uh, um, maybe we have uh, time for uh, a few questions. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor. Uh, that was indeed a wonderful session. So, well, uh, now it's time for the discussion session to begin. If you have any question or queries, then you can come up uh, with your question on the chat box. Dr. Mark will be 
happy to hear your query. Before that, I'd like to introduce our uh, today guest. You know, we also connected with uh, Dr. Novin Poriel and uh, the Nepalese, Nepalese Association of Optimist President, uh, Nirasdeep Doshi, sir. So, uh, first of all, uh, let me check the question as well. And if, okay. Hello, Dr. Novin, are we there? Yes, I'm here. Hi, Mark. Hey, Navid. Nice to see you. Sorry about that picture I showed earlier. <laughs> I was just, I actually took a snapshot of this picture to share it on <laughs> my web profile, maybe. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> it's, <clears throat> it's easy to find on Google. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but to be honest, that, that was not me. Hope you, you identified that one. <laughs> um, so, but anyway. Thanks so much for this wonderful lecture. I think I have attended a couple of your sessions as well. And <clears> every time I, I learn something new from you, which is fantastic. And I think it's a privilege to a Nepalese optometrist to be able to, you know, obtain such kind of uh, lecture from a eminent personality who is a kind of a really, you know, well-known in the field of myopia and in optometry. Yeah. So I'd like to thank you so much for your time and um, we'll take some questions probably, and then I'll have a final question at the end probably later on. So, okay. Thanks. Okay, well, thanks for great. the kind words, Nabin. No problem. Okay, so I would like to go with the first question. The first question with the uh, brain remote, sir. So the question goes like, it said, excellent is metric factor to see the efficacy. How come other factors like outdoor activities, our serum levels, family history affect, uh, affect <clears> and predisposing factor counts the regression curve? <clears throat> well, that's a complicated question that I'll try and uh, answer as best I can. Um, you know, there is a very, um, in normally, my, normal myopic eyes, there's a very high correlation between axial elongation and myopia progression. Um, and it doesn't matter um, ideally which one we would measure. Um, a lot of our data that we have um, are from studies where they didn't measure axial elongation. It's often not convenient to measure axial length in uh, a large population of children. You might not have the technology, but generally, um, when there are data on outdoor activity and serum levels and family history, um, the effect on axial elongation and the effect on refractive error is, is basically the same. Um, as I said, you know, one of the major reasons for using axial elongation is it's not confounded um, by some of our treatments that affect the, uh, the optics of the eye. So when we put an ortho K, lens on the eye, we're altering the optics and obviously we have to measure axial elongation to assess the progression. Same with atropine, even with small doses of atropine, we're modifying the uh, accommodative apparatus, we're changing the lens um, and we can be misled if we rely entirely on refractive error. So I hope uh, I've answered your uh, question as best that I can. So. Nabin, you got some more questions? Well, that's a great doctor. So well, I got I'm... I got I got one just popped up on my screen. Okay. Okay. Um, so is there any factors that you would put in order, like one, two, three, just like we do in the latest formula for our IOL calculations? So in terms of factors that affect myopia progression, number one is age. Younger myopes progress more than older myopes, okay? Number two is race. East Asian eyes, Japanese, Chinese, um, progress more rapidly, probably 40% more rapidly than uh, European eyes, okay? <clears throat> and I apologize for uh, South Asians for being excluded from that discussion. Um, third one is family history. Um, we know family history is a risk factor for the onset of myopia, but children with more myopic parents tend to progress faster than uh, 
par- uh, children with no myopic parents. And finally, uh, there's a small effect of gender. Uh, girls seem to progress a little bit faster, maybe 10% faster than, than, uh, um, <clears throat> than, than boys. So in terms of rate of progression, that's my one, two, three, four. Okay, I hopefully, uh, uh, Barendra, I hopefully uh, answered your question. If you on, wanted to know my, uh, um, if you wanted to know my one, two, three, four for uh, myopic control, um, I would say that, you know, ortho K, an appropriate soft lens, an appropriate spectacle lens like the DIMS or an appropriate concentration of atropine are all relatively equal. The one that uh, uh, clearly is the most effective, although there's a risk of a rebound, is a higher concentration atropine. So my friends in the Netherlands, they tend to prescribe half a percent atropine um, for young myopic kids who are obviously uh, at risk of uh, developing high levels of myopia. And they seem to get good success. You obviously got to put a kid in uh, a progressive lens, an multifocal lens, and preferably give them photochromics. But uh, even with uh, you know, high levels of high concentrations of atropine in a uh, very young myope or a you know, six or seven year old myope of onset um, can, according to them, be uh, a, a meaningful treatment. Okay, Nabin, what, oh, what's um, this? What, uh, I got another question for Brenda here. Type in like a fool. Um, <laughs> what uh, brand would you suggest? Um, well, I'm a, I've done work for uh, Cooper Vision and Paragon, which are now part of the same company. I've done a little work for Euclid. Um, one thing that's evident from the orthokeratology literature is that all of the brands that have been started seem to have similar effects. There doesn't seem to be any superiority. And even when people have tried to manipulate the optical zone, thinking, oh, if we have a smaller optical zone, we'll get more plus, it doesn't seem to have much effect. So uh, um, use what you can get your hands on, study the results, and uh, uh, maybe you'll find out something new. Yeah. So I think, thanks, Mark. Very helpful talk. Just one question. Uh, could be a comment as well. Um, so, uh oh, Nepali is. You haven't ta- got. Uh, Sorry. You haven't got any of your colleagues in the room, have you? You haven't got James in the room with you. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> okay, just checking. I'm at home. You know that where everybody is working from home here. Um, yeah. Okay. And, um, yeah. So no, it's not it's not just a question or it's just a comment probably. Um, so in in terms of like the low resource settings in Nepal or India, probably India has a little bit more access than in Nepal, uh, where we don't have those ortho K lenses and soft contact lenses and the dims lenses and everything. So I actually presented delivered a lecture a couple of weeks ago on myopia control, which was a high level kind of you know just I didn't go in detail of the research studies and things like that, but I just gave them like these are the particular interventions that are effective and things like that. So what would be your suggestion when, you know, um, kind of when you don't have resources like that? And so, so what? Yeah, there's a lot of evidence, but so what? How can we? And then the only thing that's available at the moment is 0.01% atropine. And I have been actually recommending, recommending them at least. It's better. Than, <laughs> something is better than nothing. It's better, better than yeah, no, I would, I would yeah. say that uh, you do what you can. Um, you know, one thing I've, I'm working on at the moment is the idea that, you know, um, that old saying is uh, an ounce of prevention is, you know, a pound of cure or better than a pound of cure. Um, delaying onset is one of the best things we can do, and um, particularly um, in younger, uh, younger onset myopes. If you could delay onset um, by just a year, by sending them outside more or whatever else you think works. Delaying onset by a year will ultimately save about three quarters, maybe our diopter of myopia. So it's as good, one year of prevention is as good as our best therapies right now in terms of the ultimate level of myopia. So I think um, you know, if you don't have access to fancy lenses, then embrace the behavioral approach and really work with parents, with teachers, with whoever else, 
to encourage the kids at a young age to spend more time outdoors. Now, um, you know, as you said, any something's better than nothing. Yeah, if all you've got is a low concentration of atropine, use it. If all you've got is bifocals, try it. Okay, um, and hopefully um, over time we can uh, maybe work with uh, our friends in the optical industry to get uh, access to uh, uh, some of these uh, fancy lenses at a reduced uh, reduced cost. So. Yeah. Talk to me about that, and I'll talk to my friends. See what we can do. Sure. But right. everybody's trying to. Uh, everybody's having difficulty making money in the current climate. So, uh, and yeah. spectacle lens business has been completely uh, decimated by by this because you know, with contact lenses, at least you've got you know plan replacement, two week, um, daily. Yeah. People are still selling contact lenses. Spectacle yeah. lenses, if there aren't any exams. There is no spectacle lens sales, and you know one of the biggest and oldest companies in the United Kingdom just went out of business um, because of the uh, the current situation. So it's sad to see. So anyway, sorry, so, too much public health and politics. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's fine. No problem. Well, thank you so yeah. much. I think we are learned. Uh, okay, yeah. uh, just a minute, Dr. Lavin. So we have. Uh, another question. So, Dr. Sofa also wanted some question. Can you please unmute yourself and ask question, Dr. Sofa? Hi, Mark. Safal here. Great talk. Hi, it's always a pleasure listening to you. I, you. Um, I have a question about low dose atropine. Um, considering the message that is out there to the practitioners, um, which side of the fence are you in? Is it start low, go slow, or is it the bigger, the better? Um, I would encourage, um, if you look at what we said in our recent review, so this is the Bullimore and Richdale Myopia 2020 article. Um, one thing we suggest is that is to kind of be the doctor. Um, you've got two eyes. Um, so I would start on a, I would say, a relatively high dose. I would start with 0 0.02 or 0 0.05 and start it on one eye. See the kid a week or two later and measure the accommodation, the pupil size in that one eye. You haven't disrupted their life too much. Okay. You, uh, and of course, with a myopic kid, they can always take their glasses off to read. Um, but see what kind of effect you're getting. Um, if you're not getting in very much dilation, then the drug's probably not effective enough because, as I said during the lecture, atropine's equipotent across all five muscarinic receptors. So start treating one eye, see what you get, and then if you want to increase the dose or increase the concentration or lower the concentration, you can do so. So one of my problems with... Uh, and it's perhaps more with the ophthalmology community, but the eye community in general is that people have drunk the Kool-Aid. They, you know, they've, they've, they've heard the message about 0 0.01 and they're being kind of lazy about it. They're almost treating it as an over-the-counter drug. It's like, okay, I'm giving the kid atropine, I'm doing myopic control. And they're not really paying attention to uh, whether it's the right concentration or not. So I encourage people to, you know, be the doctor. I mean, you wouldn't put a, person on a blood pressure um, medication or a glaucoma drop without measuring the IAOP or the blood pressure uh, a few weeks later to see how it's doing. So why would you not with atropine where you've got a therapeutic index in terms of pupil size or accommodation, why would you not see whether the drugs having an effect? Because if you're not getting much pupil dilation, there's not much drug to get into the retina. Okay, so that's my message. That's a great question, Safal. Thanks for uh, giving me the chance to uh, answer it. Oh, pleasure, and thanks for uh, thanks for your insights. Totally agree with you. The reason I say that is because uh, our ophthalmology colleagues often say we practice the lowest dose medicine ethics. So, <laughs> you know, there is uh, some mixed message out there. So it's getting good yeah, to get your. Zero percent is even lower. Well, you, you might be surprised. There are people who are who would not be 
uh, hesitant to start with that as well, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we yeah, we call them. Uh, this is there's a name for that uh, kind of dose. Anyway, but no, thanks for your comment. Thank you. Well, doctor. Well, okay. I guess we come so far, and I still I saw the one question on the chat box. Can you? Let's see it, doctor, or shall I read out for you? Uh, well, about the, regarding progressive and bifocal, is it to be used for near work only, or how easily young adapt to this? Um, my impression, okay, and it's my impression. I don't see patients is particularly with a progressive lens, um, kids adapt well to it. So if you look at data from the Comet study or other studies around the world, um, compliance was high. You didn't have kids dropping out. And in the same way, kids can adapt well to um, a multifocal contact lens. You know, they're pretty resilient. Um, you know, the big thing with kids is how does it look cosmetically? And... Whereas executive bifocals um, may be, you know, pretty effective, you know, they look really ugly, okay? Um, so you have to treat the whole patient rather than just their eyes and figure out what you're doing to them with the different therapies. So that would be my only advice there. But um, with, uh, with these lenses, I think the more they wear them, the better. Um, certainly compliance was very high in the MySight trials such that they really couldn't affect, uh, assess the effect of wear time because it was so high. Um, the same with bifocals. The more you wear them, the better. A great question. Okay. I guess we are uh, about uh, end, of the session, uh, end of the discussion session. So yeah. let me take one. I think one everybody needs there. to go to bed. Uh, oh, Doctor, I still <laughs> I want to add the one personality from the Nepalese, uh, uh, Nepalese Association of Optometrists. I would like to request uh, Naveen sir to give some uh, words regarding the shake. Did you say me? Kapil or? Neeraj uh, uh, Devdoshi sir. Okay, yeah. Right. Uh, Niraj, sir, we can see you. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. That, that's why I was confused. Hey, Niraj. Hi, hi, Mark. It was really great to have you here, and I, I would like it's to pleasure. thank you. Uh, you took time to be with us. So, uh, thank you on behalf of Nepalese Association of Optometrists, and uh, I would like to congratulate uh, Miro Eye Foundation that they managed to have you here. And, uh, and today we, ha we are having a wonderful topic that is a public health concern, especially if you see it is more in the Asian countries. And um, so amid this uh, COVID-19 scare, uh, <clears throat> it is the best way to get uh, knowledge from the international faculties. And thank you that you are here. And once uh, say we get rid of this uh, COVID-19 scare, we'd like to see you in our country. Please be with us. I'd love uh, that. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. For I, uh... Yeah, have you been I, uh, to my, Nepal my, before? Have you been to Nepal? No, before? but my uh, my 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 fiance is very keen to uh, go hiking in the Himalayas. So uh, please, you're she'll, please I, be and we'll... I'll have to have to bring bring her with me, and uh, she wants mm -hmm. to uh, see some see some real mountains out there. So I'd love that. So thanks for the invitation, and we'll we'll, we'll make that happen sometime, and maybe I can uh, find some sponsorship uh, to bring me out there and. Uh, uh, so we'll look, we'll look forward to that and uh, uh, meeting in person and sharing some good food. Yeah, yeah. thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And uh, today we had your virtual session. I hope we'll have, soon have your real session as well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. And uh, good day and uh, in enjoy your uh, evening. And uh, I wish you the very best for the future. Thanks, Mark. Okay, doctor. Yes. Yes, please. Mobat Marine. All right. Bye bye. Uh, all right. So I'd like to uh, again express my immense, uh, immense gratitude towards Dr. Mark and all the attendees for their endurance. And also, I'd like to thank all the direct and indirect helping hands 
for the ITIC program. Thank you so much. Have a good time. So, Bye, everyone. Have a good time.